Heavenly Father, speak to us today, not as infants or adolescents, but as mature. Feed us not only the milk of thy word and the bread of thy word, but feed us the meat of your word that we may transform and mature into effective vessels for the master's use. Change our minds, O God, which is truly repentance. Change our perception. Free us from the bondage of trying to mix, put the new wine in an old vessel. Give us the freshness of your spirit. And as we approach the holy sacraments today, let us go as sons and daughters of God, not condemned or judged or shamed, but empowered with your flesh and blood to walk out your preordained and pre-designed destiny for each one of us collectively as your body in the earth. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. How many of you appreciated the worship this morning? I thought it was awesome. And of course, we know, we know worship is more than a song. Worship is a lifestyle. My reasonable worship is to present my body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That's my reasonable worship. It's not whether I sing with the bishop and the music team. As you all know, and those of you who are watching, don't let the robes and the bling and the bells and the smells fool you. We are full gospel people who embrace the ancient apostolic tradition of the church uh, going back to the first three centuries of the church. Although we have a contemporary expression, Jesus relates to every generation that he calls. And so that's, that's why you might see things that, you know, we have saxophone and bands and TV screens and <laughs> the pot of gear, the don't let that freak you out. My title of my message today is You Cannot Leverage God. You can't negotiate with God. You can't make a deal with God. You do this. If I do this, if I do this, you do this. In the tradition of the Orthodox Church, and of course we all know we're an independent Orthodox Church, so we're not necessarily recognized in the Sea of Antioch, Although they acknowledge our apostolic succession, they're very generous and kind to us, and they let us do our missionary work. In the Orthodox Church, you recognize your bishops as God in your midst. Now, that's hard for the Western mind because you all know I'm not even close to being godly enough to be recognized as God in your midst. But we know in the natural, we have to understand that they also recognize your deacons as the Holy Spirit among you. They should be modeling a spirit-led life. And your priests as Christ in your midst. That's why the priest stands at the altar as Christ. He doesn't stand in his own power to communion. So in our faith, it's hard. That's why people don't understand when people come up to read the scripture, they come and ask for a blessing from the bishop. This chair represents something far beyond my personality or me. It represents God's presence in the earth in his church, of which he is the head. So we cannot leverage God. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So this whole thing is about his body, which was not just the body that was crucified and then ascended in glory, but it's about his body that is present today in the church with When he ascended, he gave gifts to men, some to be apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists. Not everyone in the body of Christ is an ordained or consecrated, but we're all priests and kings of God. No one is over you. This is not a hierarchical thing. It's a circle of patriarchal oneness. Are you following me? We don't serve a hierarchy. We serve a circle of submission and authentic truth in love. It was business as usual when Jesus shows up at the temple. It, was, it wasn't like he suddenly said, oh my God, they're selling, you know, they're exchanging money. This was business. This was religious business as usual. He wasn't shocked by it. He didn't suddenly get mad. Wow, I'm mad now. <laughs> this was usual places and usual activities for the people. God is in the business of interrupting business as usual. (laughs) God is in the business of interrupting business as usual. We call this BAU, business as usual. 
He gets angry. It's okay to be angry as long as you don't sin in your anger. He didn't just show up. The, that's how the system worked. And there's a worldly system that works the way the world works. And then there's a kingdom system that works. As Alex said earlier, there's a kingdom economy and then there's an earthly economy. There's a kingdom order. There's a he- earthly order. There's a government. There's a kingdom government. There's an earthly government. And our call is to serve the heavenly government economy and order. That's, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Behold, all things have passed away. Behold, all things have come new. And the church exists for us to support one another in community to be deprogrammed from an old system that is business as usual. Somebody help me up here. That's where we're at. There are times when we need the tables of our lives overturned. There are times we need the tables of our lives interrupted and overturned by God. It can get messy and chaotic when the the Lord is overturning tables in our community. It can get messy and chaotic. And the beast nature and the carnal perception need to be driven out. Carnal thinking, emotionalism, and secular Humanism needs to be driven out of his temple, which is the body, because his temple can't be healthy with those concepts in it. And so that's why we come to church, to address these issues in our lives and to collectively have mercy on us. We pray at the Vesper prayers. Our lives are interrupted. We go to Vespers on Friday night. We, we um, give up some things. We should all be going to reconciliation and confessing our weaknesses to one another and praying for one another in this sign in our life. There should be no secrets. No secret conversations. No secret activity. For all things are exposed in the light in the kingdom of God. Can I get an amen? Lent interrupts business as usual. Paradigms in our life. And we're all under the same Temple activity. Sometimes we look at life and the world and it all seems in vain. We're busy but not really getting anywhere. There's no depth. There's no meaning to our life. Only business as usual. And then life becomes mundane. Lent interrupts that thing. Sometimes we, we just, business as usual infects our friendships. We become too familiar. We become too familiar with each other. We forget that the person I'm sitting next to is God's servant. Not just clergy. Clergy is identified to model something, not oversee and control anything. Are you here? The problem is not so much the temple, the problem is the heart, the human heart. The problem's in the heart, it's not in the structure. The problem's in the human. No one knows another man's heart. Not one of us know another person's heart. You can't know another person's heart and you can't monitor another person's heart. You don't know when someone has changed or when someone's got astray because only God can look upon the heart. And in the temple, that's the first thing we need to remember. Nobody knows the heart of another person. Nobody's walked in the shoes of another person. Nobody knows what happened to somebody as a child, what happened to them in an abusive marriage, what happened to them in their family. None of us have walked in someone else's shoes. The deeper issue is what gives rise to this business as usual mentality. Sometimes it's about our fears. When we get afraid, we want things to be controllable and normal. So we exchange kingdom principles for secular principles because we want to be in control and control. The future is uncertain. We want some type of security and predictability. That's human nature. We do not like the unknown. That's why most of us don't want to die. It isn't that we're afraid of death. We just don't know what's there. We don't want to go somewhere we don't know what what we're going to face, right? It isn't death. It's the fear of the unknown. That's human. And we keep on going and doing the same old things over and over, keep repeating ourselves because we don't break out of a pattern. 
The BAU is predictable. Business as usual is predictable and steady, but only creates an illusion of security and control. It can be a symptom of our grief and sorrow. It can be an addiction to the familiar. It can be what we want, some stability and desire, some control. Maybe we've taken people, our relationships, and things for granted. Maybe we've lost gratitude and gratefulness for the blessings that we have. We've lost the wonder and the mystery of the kingdom. And so we exchange it for manipulation, and that's what happens when you abandon the mystery, you move into manipulation. Did you hear what I said? That's an abandonment of the mystery of life. There are thousands of reasons and ways in which we fall into business as usual. There's one thing we keep, from com- we keep coming back to. Business as usual is born out of forgetting who we are. <laughs> now we are the son. We forget who we are. We start to think we're just human again. We have been made partakers of the divine nature. And that means we have to constantly remind ourselves, don't forget who you are, which was the message last week. And then forgiveness and then fear. Fear of loss, mostly fear of loss of control. I said it at Vespers the other night. The best definition of suffering I can come up with, and I can't really take credit for it, because one of the ancient fathers said it, is suffering is the loss of control. When you lose control, you've moved into a place of suffering where you have to permit something to happen without your control. That's what suffering means, to permit. So we forget that we're really the temple of God's presence. We forget that we are a community of his oneness. In the 14th century, it was inspired by the anonymous author, The Cloud of Unknowing, taught in God, that Christ dealt with sin, death, forgiveness, and salvation all in one lump. He did it in one lump. Jesus by himself entered history as an individual, a divine individual, but the universal Christ is compelling image for one lump of reality. We are all one in him. The mystery is he has redeemed us all in one lump. That's from the the book, The Cloud of Unknowing. The collective notion is what Christians try to verbalize when they refer to the belief in the communion of the saints or the common union of the saints, both visible and invisible. So when he's talking about his body, he's talking more about the circumstances we're battling through on this earth. He's talking about the full communion of saints. We forget we're created in his image and likeness. Amen? And so we have to battle against the devil's triangle. Beware of the devil's triangle, which is budgets, buildings, and beasts, which is human structures and organizations, manipulation with money, and emo- over emotionalism, which is a beastly nature. They didn't see themselves or one another as the true temple of God. It was all about the human-built temple they were focused on. That's why they said 46 years here. They had forgotten that God was more interested in them than in their festivals. God's more interested in you than this worship service and wanted them more than their offerings. He wanted them more than he wanted their offerings. I talk very little about money in this church because I don't want it to become a manipulation thing. If you're mature, you know you should return the tithe and give offerings, and that you're not giving it to me or to the ministry. You're giving it to God. It's holy unto God. It's not for you to control or manipulate. And we don't need to manipulate people to give. Once you know it's holy to God, the minute it's out of your hands, it's in God's hands. And either you believe that or you don't believe that. Same with your offerings. I, I'm, I think the postmodern church, especially in the 90s and early 2000s, was so money-driven, it corrupted the whole church and turned it into a marketplace. It turned it into a place of transaction. I remember I was preaching in the old church when, before uh, Eric ran through the wall. And I was preaching, and I said, uh, I was teaching on giving, and a guy stood up, he said, when your wife sells her car, then I'll start giving. Dude, you ain't manipulating God with your money. 
God, when you, you know, uh, well, when you get rid of your Rolex watch, then we'll start to give a little bit. That watch was a gift from a couple in this church who's married was saved. But they were like the people who just saw the 46-year temple. They didn't have any discernment in their mind. They wanted, see, here's how you know when you've been taken captive, when you start to manipulate with the things of God. Life can easily become a series of transactions. Relationships and intimacy are then lost. Authentic honesty is lost. The love of money is the root of all evil. It either has you or you have it. I'm not against money, but I understand what money is. It's a representation of my heart. For where your treasure is, your heart will be. All money is is proves where my heart is. It's either with God or it's with the world. Life becomes a marketplace. Making a living replaces living a life. That's for free. Making a living replaces living a life. When things get out of balance. It becomes a marketplace rather than a place for meeting the divine in ourselves and one another. Money is the great manipulator. It is the great manipulator. I never talk about it, but it means it's the the first Sunday of the third quarter. I will mention a couple of things because usually we address this. Usually Deacon Damien addresses it, but I'm going to address it today. The tithe is holy to the Lord. Trusting in the heavenly economy. But we've never judged people on whether they tithe or give. Whether they tip God or tithe to God is not my business. It is the sacred source of our love. It is the sacred source of our love and trust solely in God. It's our trust in God. It is to be a sincere, pure return of our worship and not contaminated with manipulation. Oh, God, I'm going to start giving to you because I want you to do something. Oh, I'm in trouble, so now I'm going to start coming to church. Oh, I'm going to start praying now because I'm caught in a bind. And we have to hold each other accountable in this thing so that the temple of our Lord can have a pure motivation in it. God, do this. God, do that. We don't give it to the ministries, pastors. We don't give it to the leaders or the bishops. We return it to God without any agenda. We give our time, our talent, and our treasure without agenda. And this was the main thing in the scripture about the money changers. It is returned to the storehouse of the body of the Christ, the communion of saints, and released from our hands without any deception or manipulation. It proves where our heart is. Judas was left in the circle of disciples even though Jesus knew he was stealing from the coffer. Why? He chose him. The disciples came and said, he's stealing. He said, leave him alone. Why would Jesus? That's some sketchy leadership right there. Because he would not be manipulated by money, good or bad. They're not manipulating me. He says he's got to do what he's got to do, whether you understand it or not. Huh? To prove God cannot be leveraged, to prove God cannot be manipulated or intimidated, Jesus chose and left him there. That's some sketchy, sketchy leadership. The love of money is the root of all evil. But let me put it this way, not money, not physical money, the root of power and control. You either have it or it has you. It is the cause of most relational breakdowns. At the center of most divorces is money. At the center of most disagreements, money. It is the true tester of the presence of manipulation. 
You cannot serve both God and money. It's impossible for you will love one and despise the other or hold fast to one and reject the other. The church doesn't have to beg for money. The church doesn't have to manipulate for money. The church doesn't have to control people's minds and emotions with money. If you're a son of God and you're born again, God will give you the revelation of what you're supposed to do with your servant, with your resources, and you'll be a steward of God. The minute money becomes the negotiator, in our relationships, you have entered the devil's triangle. Triangulation starts there. It's funny, God has three sides and the devil has three sides. <laughs> he's, a, he's an inverted, he's a polarization of it. Alex hit the economy, I didn't even talk to him today. He hit the economy of God, love, mercy, and kindness. The devil's triangle is manipulation. Systematic control and emotional deception. That's what Jesus is overturning and driving out of the temple. He says, this is my father's house. This stuff isn't there. He faces it head on. And if you are in a place, you better have a leader who faces that junk head on. He would not tolerate. He would not tolerate it. And in an attempt to manipulate God with human structure, human economy, human wisdom, as we read about early, on God's most foolish day, he's wiser than anybody. Christ will have nothing to do with it. He angers him, and he confronts it. He says, you're not doing this in my father's house. We ain't putting up with it. Either change or get out. This happened at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. Also, here's what happened. He interrupted business as usual in some other areas, and I'm, I'm about to finish. I got five minutes. The Word became flesh, water became wine, and now the temple is becoming human instead of bricks. And throughout the rest of the gospel, Jesus is interrupting business as usual. He interrupted the business of wine. He interrupted the business of a building. He interrupted business. Take the Samaritan woman at the well. She's had five husbands and she's still living with a man that is not her husband. It's another manifestation of cultural business as usual. In those days, a woman had to have a man to be valid. We don't know why she had five men and the one she's with now, but it was a cultural pressure on her. But it's not about her. Jesus recognizes her as the temple of God, not as a woman running around with men. It is neither on this Samaritan mountain nor in this Jerusalem. He says, forget about this physical well. I'm interrupting the physical well. Now you're going to become the well. So he says, now I'm interrupting what a well is. It's not in the ground. It's in your heart. Somebody say amen. What about the man paralyzed for 30 years? He goes to the same pool for 30 years. Everybody beats him to the pool to be healed. Finally, God says, I'm going to interrupt it. He said, stand up and get going. He interrupted being paralyzed. We all know people that are paralyzed with stuff. We all know people that are paralyzed with things. We're there to interrupt the pattern, not condemn the pattern. For 38 years, it's business as usual. Then Jesus comes and says, stand up. What about Lazarus? What did Jesus interrupt with Lazarus? He's been in the tomb three days. It stinks like death. He interrupts death. He said, death isn't death anymore. I'm going to interrupt death. How many people do we know that are dead right now? They're dead in their spirit. They're dead in the... God wants to interrupt them with the body of Christ. I'm about done. What about the 5,000 people who only have two fish and two loaves? There's a lack Somebody say there's a lack. God interrupts lack. God interrupts lack with multiplication. Because he's a God of multiplication, not a God of addition. Somebody ought to be shouting happy right now. Say, God, interrupt my lack. He wasn't mad at the people. He drove out of the temple what was contrary to the temple. Over and over again, Jesus is interrupting. Over and over again, Jesus is disrupting. Over and over again, God is overturning things in our life and throwing out the worldly and religious business as usual in our life. 
It is destructive to our lives and relationships. It destroys our ability to participate in the sacred holiness that is already present and among us. Stand up with me this morning. I have a lot more I'd like to say, but I am being obedient to my time. Otherwise, I'm going to have to have a conversation with Alex after church. Beware of the devil's triangle. Tell two people, beware of the devil's triangle. It looks like light. It looks like God. Because he comes as an angel of light. The devil never looks like the devil in the church. The devil looks like religion in the church. Somebody help me. Building structures. Budgets, money, economic systems and manipulation, carnal emotion, secular wisdom, and human effort. These are the things that Jesus was addressing in the temple. These things blind kingdom vision. The word became flesh so that the temple might become human. So what does the temple of your life need today? Close your eyes for a minute. What tables in your life need to be overturned? Where have you gotten off track? What animals, what beastly nature that feeds mistrust, unforgiveness, and bitterness needs to be driven out? Are you attempting to manipulate God to get your way? I'll start paying my tithes and give bigger offerings. God, if you just work, I'll stop giving if I don't get my way. I'll stop attending service because I tried it and my life got worse. God cannot be manipulated. You must see what needs to happen is that you don't need to become holy. You must recognize that you're already the temple. And claim what is already yours. One with Christ and one with his people. Jesus does not make us into something we are not. He calls us back to what we've always been. From when he created us in him before time. He was speaking of the temple of his body. The incorruptible church. The imperishable church. The temple of the Holy Spirit. It cannot be corrupted, for Jesus will build his church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Never forget that one fact. He will build his church. He knows how to clean house. Jesus knows how to clean his father's house. It's not our job to clean it. He'll clean it himself. He says he will clean his bride and present her to himself. It's not our job to clean any house here. It's our job to be the house. He'll overturn the tables of attempted leveraging, confound the wisdom of the human beast nature, and all manipulation. You cannot leverage God. Let us profess our faith in Almighty God. We believe in one God. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ. 